Touch tablets come in all different sizes, shapes, and forms, so many so that often it doesn't make sense to talk about them in a collective form. However, they do share a number of important properties. First of all, they have no mechanical parts, which can fail. Second of all, that same property means that they can often be built in very low-profile devices, such as keyboards, where other transducers wouldn't be effective or appropriate. They also happen to be not very susceptible to dirt. In hospitals and factories, they can easily be cleaned or kept sanitary. Because there's no puck, you also don't have wire fatigue. So again, in hostile environments where there's a lot of usage, as every headphone user knows, wire flex causes failure. And finally, they're not susceptible to vibration, since unlike a tablet where if you leave something and bump it, you lose your position, on a touch tablet, your finger is the indicator. Lift it off, and you've kept your spot. In the rest of this tape, we're going to take a look at some examples that illustrate the use of touch tablets in specific contexts that show some of their strengths and weaknesses, but certainly which differentiate them from other input devices. This pocket calculator, for example, allows me to enter numbers by drawing them on a touch-sensitive surface, one and two, for example, or alternatively, it allows me to enter them on the touch surface by pushing virtual buttons delimited on the menu drawn graphically on the touch surface. Again, I've entered a 1 and 2. With this example, we can demonstrate how the tablet can sense position as well as degree of touch. We've hooked it up to a sound, and so we've got a high, pure sound here, pitch going down as I descend, and richness with X, and degree controlling volume. And I can finger paint. Let's take a look at a common transaction, that of dragging, where you pick up an item from a menu, drag it across the screen, and then drop it in the location where you want it. This provides an excellent context to illustrate the importance of pressure with touch-sensitive tablets. If we try to perform the same dragging transaction using a touch tablet, we can run into problems. What happens when we are pointing at the item and now want to pick it up? We can lift our finger off the tablet surface and then bring it back down again, but that results in an undesirable discontinuity in the gesture. Another approach is to push a function key on the keyboard to signal to pick it up but this involves another device and perhaps another hand, again, perhaps undesirable. If the touch tablet can sense pressure, however, pushing a virtual button by crossing a pressure threshold can pick the item up, and we can now drag it into position and anchor it, again, in a manner analogous to a mouse, by another threshold crossing. This problem of picking up items can be seen with other devices as well, such as the trackball where to indicate selection, we must involve the use of a function key. Okay. Often, when we want to use the tablet surface to emulate a number of different virtual devices, it's useful to use a physical template laid over top of the tablet. Here I have five virtual potentiometers defined by their uh, cutouts as well as a number of buttons. By attaching it to the tablet surface, I now have an operating console for a particular simulation. In this case, it's a small sound synthesizer, which I can turn on an oscillator. I can now adjust its volume and adjust its pitch and its spectral richness. As you can see, the three different controls can affect three completely different parameters. I can add a second oscillator, raise its volume, change its richness, bring the pitch down, and even add a third oscillator. And I can shut them all off. What we have is an operating console done on a single physical device, which is reconfigurable depending on what template I have. And it saves going through all of the mechanical effort to construct the analogous or the equivalent device, such as this one here, 
where I have, likewise, some single dimensional sliders and some button devices. The, finally, the raised edges on the template work much like frets on a guitar or the cracks between the keys in a piano. That is, they give tactile feedback that allow us to touch type on this tablet surface, thereby freeing our eyes to focus on things that are perhaps more important than the actual operating console. What we can do is now take a look at the touch tablet in the context of a simple paint program. In this program, the screen is broken down into two regions. Region 1 is the region for painting, where the image will occur, and Region 2 is where the color palette is displayed. Similarly, the tablet is partitioned into two regions, or what we call windows, one being the drawing surface and the other the region for color selection. In touching the tablet, we get a tracking symbol. This only occurs when we use light touch. This does not leave any ink trail, so we can go across and select a color, for example, for drawing purposes. By giving an extra bit of pressure when we get over the color blue in this case, we will select blue, and now we can go back into the drawing region and use the blue for painting. If Peter pushes a little harder to get a virtual button push, we can now start to lay down an ink trail. You'll notice if he pushes harder as he's painting, he gets line thickness changes. So we're using pressure not only to signal virtual button pushes, but also in the continuous dimension for line thickness. Going back to the color palette now, we can select a different color, push hard to have it pick it up, and now move back into the drawing region and lay down an ink trail in the green color. Unlike a mouse, this touch tablet delivers absolute coordinates rather than relative coordinates, so he doesn't have to drag across to the color palette. He can just jump over, pick up gray, and jump back and lay down the gray ink trail. Using the tablet for two different functions is much like having windows on two different virtual devices, one for painting and the other for color selection. We can actually open up another window, one that allows us to mix a new color, by pushing a virtual button in the bottom right-hand corner of the tablet. We've now partitioned the tablet surface into three virtual devices, each one a potentiometer controlling one of the primary colors. Therefore, motion up and down at the left of the tablet controls the red component in the new color. Motion up and down in the center of the tablet controls the component green. And motion in the right-hand side of the tablet controls the blue pigment. Adjusting the three of them together, we can mix any color in RGB color space. And when we've got the color that we want, we can now push another virtual device, a button in the right-hand corner, which will return us to the original painting. And we can now add to the painting using the new color that we've just mixed. Finally, the obvious extension to partitioning the tablet into a number of virtual devices is to support multi-touch sensing. By doing so, we can allow more than one virtual device to be operated at a time. We illustrate this capability using a prototype tablet developed by Lee, Buxton, and Smith at the University of Toronto. Here, the three virtual potentiometers can be simultaneously manipulated in a configuration similar to that seen in our color mixing example.